Hello, friends and neighbors, and welcome to the latest edition of the Gifts for Glory podcast. I'm your host, Dave Ebert, and here on the Gifts for Glory podcast, we're back for our first episode after a couple weeks off, uh, kind of getting over the uh, whole uh, Pure Fest hangover, if you will, because it was just such a mad dash to get to Pure Fest on September 27th and 28th that we just needed some time to, uh, to rest, recover, uh, kind of decompress, if you will. So we're back. We're going to come back with more great interviews coming up later on. We've got some great, amazing people. Because what we do here on the Gifts for Glory podcast is we celebrate and promote men and women of God who use their gifts, talents, and passions to honor and glorify God. That's what we're all about. That's what we want to do. So what we want to do today is a, a special edition of the Gifts for Glory podcast. Is A few months back, I gave a message at Cross Point Church, and I wanted to share it with you. I uh, haven't been able to share it yet on the podcast, and I wanted to share it uh, not as a boast or as a brag, but I wanted to just share it because one of my gifts that I feel that God has given me is the ability to speak, the ability to articulate and to explain and to stand up in front of crowds and and just express what God has put on my heart. So I wanted to do that here today and give you one of the messages I've given at Cross Point Church, my home church, also the host of... Uh, Pure Fest a few weeks ago. So I hope you enjoy this message. And before we get to it, I do want to let you know that as Gifts for Glory Ministries grows, as this podcast grows, as Wellverse Comedy grows and Pure Fest grows, we want to become effective and efficient. We want to be able to provide everything that we need in order to make every one of these ventures a success. Because the hashtag OGHG, our gifts for his glory, is all about doing the best that we can because we serve a God of excellence. So as we try to grow and as we try to achieve different things and uh, and reach different uh, milestones, one of the things we're doing is we started a Patreon page. So if you're willing to help come alongside us and support Gifts of Glory Ministries, Pure Fest, Wellverse Comedy, if you want to support us in a, uh, in a small or large financial way, you can do so through Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash gifts, the number four, glory. That's patreon.com slash gifts for glory and sign up to be one of our patrons. Got a couple of uh, different levels that you can give at if you'd like to support what we're doing. We'd love for you to come alongside us. And uh, we have a, a few uh, insider things that we'd like to give you for your support. Um, so if you have any questions about Patreon, please give us a call, uh, an email. Uh, you can reach us at dave at giftsforglory.com. Dave at gifts, the number four, glory.com. So uh, if you're willing and able to support, we'd love to have you alongside. If nothing else, just share our podcasts. Uh, follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Share our posts and let people know what we're doing so maybe we can get more people interested and more support. So we really appreciate anything you can do to help us out and help us get going. And now we'll get to our message. Uh, This is the message I gave at Cross Point Church earlier this year. I hope you're blessed by it. I hope it speaks to you. And if you have any feedback, that email address I gave earlier, dave at giftsforglory.com, dave at giftsforglory.com. If you have any feedback, any prayer requests, anything you want to do to communicate with us, you are more than welcome to send it, uh, dave at giftsforglory.com. So now here is our podcast. It's the message I gave a few uh, uh, months ago here at Cross Point Church in Lockport, Illinois. I hope you're blessed by it. I hope you enjoy. And thank you for listening to the Gifts for Glory podcast, where we celebrate and promote men and women of God using their gifts, talents, and passions to honor and glorify God. One of the messages that Jesus gave us that Paul reiterated, go and be reconciled. Um... So today I'm going to be a little bit more transparent than maybe I should be, but I feel like this is something I wanted to share. Uh, but I want to tell a story first before we get started. Uh, one day, uh, one Sunday, there's a church a little bit bigger than ours, and there's a, a kid about eight years old. He was just staring intently at this plaque on the wall. And the pastor noticed, so he walks up, and he, he stands next to the, to, uh, to the little child. His name's Alex, and he just waits. And then finally, this, uh, uh, Alex breaks the silence. He says, Pastor, what's that? And the pastor, knowing that, uh, what it was, he said, Son, that's a, a plaque that honors the brave men and women who died in the service. So then Alex thought for a moment, and then he got a little scared. And he said, which service, the 8 or the 1030? <laughs> 
So uh, 2 Corinthians 5.18 is where we're going to start. Um, there it says, Paul says, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, the ministry of reconciliation is not only re- helping people get reconciled in their life with God, but it's also the reconciliation among the family, among the body. And we're going to talk a, a lot about that uh, for the next little bit. Um, in the dictionary, Merriam-Webster uh, offers several definitions, but the two we want to keep in mind are uh, A, to restore to friendship or harmony, or B, to settle or resolve. So those are where we're going to focus on um, what reconcile means. As I said, this is personal. Um, last week, uh, I, I shared the uh, opening scripture from Psalm 69, uh, which is kind of a heavy uh, and very weighty um, passage because it addresses depression and, and the weight of, of suffering and, and struggle, which is very unusual to share at the opening of a service because we're here to celebrate Jesus. But it was a scripture that was put on my mind because, partly because of my personal experience, which I'm about to share, but I also felt like it was something that needed to be a reminder that, that even if we're in those seasons, uh, even if we're in those seasons that we're struggling, there is hope at the end and we can be authentic and be honest with God. Um, so the reason that that scripture kind of stuck out to me is uh, for the last several uh, weeks I've been struggling because I lost a friend on Facebook because you know, that's where we all live nowadays. Um, but I have a dear friend that I met at a conference a couple of years ago, and Facebook was our means of keeping in contact and, and keeping in touch. And sometimes in social media, because I'm trying to stir conversation and trying to stir thought and trying to point out the, strug- the, the problems with the us versus them mentality, the A versus B mentality that sometimes we fall into, I try to play in the middle and I try to say things that will inspire thought and try, that may ruffle some feathers. And apparently I ruffled too many feathers because this friend who um, I treasured emailed me through Facebook and um, uh, I blotted out his name on the uh, slide so you might be able to read along with me. But he says to me, um, Dave, I just wanted to make you aware that I don't feel convicted by the Holy Spirit with your postings. In fact, I feel the opposite. I will not be Facebook friends with you anymore. There is no need to respond. And of course, because my whole point is to try to stir conversation, I responded, actually in Matthew, Jesus specifically says there is a need. Paul also addresses the issue. When you're ready to dialogue, I'm ready. Regardless, I'm sorry that you don't feel the issues I'm raising are worthy of discussion. I'm sorry the world has us so divided we can't dialogue and see each other's perspective. I'm sorry. I love you dearly, brother. I hope we can dialogue with open minds and hearts sometime soon. You are a great man and an amazing man of God. And I was hoping for a better response. He comes back with, I asked you not to respond to me, so please respect that. I will not be in touch. And then he blocked me so I can't have further conversation with him. So, and I do not say this to condemn or, or talk bad about anybody. I'm sharing a personal experience. That's why I blotted out his name. And Bobby is the only person that knows who it is because I don't want his name to be out there for people to know that this happened. I just want people to know that it happened, because this is the problem that's developing in our church, because our society in America is becoming so divided, and so A versus B. Uh, uh, It's right wing versus left wing. It's this versus that. And even if what we're standing for is biblically correct, the way that we're expressing it is not biblically correct. Because our job is not to be the Holy Spirit. Our job is not to be the source of conviction. Our job is to share the light and love of Jesus Christ. And when we're discipling people, when we're in that close-knit relationship, then we can use some of the stronger language and some of the, the more convicting language because we're in that relationship. But to use social media as a way to disciple is not w- going to work. And I'm kind of getting off uh, on a tangent, but I want to continue with this because... You know, we've allowed the powers of this world to separate us in A versus B. We think it's either the right wing or the left wing. And if you're in the middle, that means that both sides don't like you. 
If you don't like the left and the right wing, they both don't like you. So suddenly we're just arguing over nonsense, things that won't matter in 10,000 years. Will it matter how much taxes we paid 10,000 years from now? Will it matter what law they passed or what thing they legalized? Probably not. We need to live in a way that exemplifies because God puts people in power. He, it's his authority that allows people to get into power. And the arguing that we do, the A versus B that we do, is harmful to the advancement of the gospel in what I believe. Um, and it, it's not just the world. It, it's the church, even in the church. And I'm not talking about cross point. I'm talking generally. Um, generally speaking, the broad body of Christ, we fall victim to this. We let politics, ethnicity, social or economic t- uh, status divide us. And it, it reflects poorly on the gospel. So my message today is reconciliation, where we can disagree without being disagreeable, where we can understand that I don't have to see eye to eye on every single issue with you to be in relationship with you. I don't have to see eye to eye on everything to love you. Um, Let's see, Mitzi, you and Wayne have been married for a while. Have you seen eye to eye on everything? (laughs) So... When you don't see eye to eye, does that mean that Wayne hates you? No. Does that mean that you can't be in a relationship? No. Exactly. That's why we are called the bride of Christ. We're supposed to be in that marriage relationship where we can disagree without hating each other. Amen. We can think this is right and this is wrong and not be because we hate a certain person or we hate a certain group of people. But unfortunately, the world is getting into the church telling them that if you don't agree and abide by these things, it's because you're a bigot, you're full of hatred, and you don't like certain people. I say it's because we love Christ. We love what Christ has done for us and what Christ teaches us. And that's the message we need to carry with us. And that is one of the the biggest things uh, uh, that we need to remember in our ministry of reconciliation. Um. And one of the things that, that I struggle with with this incident um, where I lost a friend over social media talked to me about what upset him. It made me feel like I was disposable. When somebody makes you feel worthless, you can kind of write them off and say, okay, you know, there, there was nothing there in that relationship. When somebody makes you feel disposable, it means they picked you up, used you for a relationship for a while, and then realized you don't have value to keep that relationship going. So it just struck me, and really, this month has been a month of pain and struggle because this was somebody I I truly value as a human being, and he made me feel disposable. So because of that, that's one of the many reasons that we can look to. That's why we have to reconcile. Whenever there's a rift, we have to find the right opportunity to, to make right with a person who we have a disagreement with, who we have an argument with. We have to make it right. And sometimes it takes time. It's a process. So we're going to dive in. Uh, Jesus is talking in Matthew 5 as part of the Sermon on the Mount. In uh, verse 23, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar uh, first, and go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Jesus is saying that God values the relationships that we have more, and the relationships that his children have more than any gift that we bring to the altar. Because if we have a rift, if there is a breakdown in the body of Christ, our gift is somehow tainted because it's not from a pure place where we're right. And Jesus is clear in saying that being reconciled with your brother is more important than anything you have. So even on a Sunday morning as you're bringing your offering to the front, and you remember that you and uh, somebody here had an argument. I was going to use a name, but I don't want to single anybody out. Uh, but let, let's just say that you and somebody had an argument last weekend over, over fishing, whatever it may be, and you have not made that right. Don't put your envelope in the, in the, uh, the bowl. Go and be reconciled. Go talk to them and say, hey, I'm sorry about the way I reacted last week. Be reconciled and then bring your envelope to the bowl. It's that literal. Take that, that admonition from Christ seriously that if you have a rift, go and try to be reconciled. And later we'll talk about the pattern and, and the method of how to be reconciled. 
Uh, earlier in Matthew 5, 9, uh, during the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So here, even before he gets into the verse that we just read during the Sermon on the Mount, he's saying, if you are a peacemaker, you are a child of God. So that not only means if you make peace with people that you have a, 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 a rift with, but if you're somebody that stands in the middle and tries to bring people together, you are blessed and you are a child of God. So here, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is very clear about the need for unity and reconciliation. He's not saying that we all have to agree on every single thing. He's just saying that we need to be in relationship. We need to be together. Because in an example that I like to give, it's easy for the roaring lion that's looking for something to devour to pick the one off. But when you're in a pack, it's harder for that one lion to pick off an entire pack. So we need to be in a pack and prepared and cover each other. We need to surround the injured and the hurting so that that roaring lion can't come and devour them. We need to protect them, lift them up. And then when we are hurt, they need to come around us and protect us from that roaming lion looking to devour and destroy. As Paul describes, we are part of one body. Uh, I use the example of the pack, but we're also part of one body. And in 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 14 through 27, Paul really explains that each part of the body is reliant on the other. Uh, One part can't say to the other part, well, I'm not you, so I'm not part of the body. Yes, you are. Every part of the body is important. Paul describes on how some parts of the body may seem unimportant, but when that part of the body is failing and hurting, then the whole body suffers. The, the little toe is part of the body. It seems insignificant until you find furniture in the middle of the night. So every part of the body is important. Uh, for example, we're going to look at uh, verses 16 to 18. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? So we need each other. We need each other to do our jobs within the body of Christ so that we can be a fully functioning, healthy body. And we can't do that when one part of the body is not working with the other. If the hand is not working with the wrist, you're not able to do what the hand is supposed to do. You're not able to do the things that you're called to do. So we have to be reconciled. We have to be together. God chose to make us work together. In verses uh, 16 and 18, uh, verse 18, I didn't get to. Uh, but as it is, okay, I, I'm sorry, I got to go back. I missed one. Um, I just read 16, so 17 says, If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. So verse 18, Paul shows us that God designed us. He chose us for a certain role within the body. He built the body, arranged it in a certain way for a certain purpose. So we should not deny that. We should work together as the body, as we're designed. And the first step to reconciliation when there is a problem um, is forgiveness. And one of the things I want to make clear is forgiveness is never an approval It is never condoning the action or the behavior that caused the rift or or was the sin. When God forgives us, that is not an approval. That's not a stamp, a seal of that was okay. When God forgives us, he's acknowledging that there is a sin, there was a mistake, there's something that should be corrected. But the forgiveness says that we're willing to move past that sin. We're not going to hold it against you. And that is the, the important part. I think that sometimes... In our heart, we feel when we say you're forgiven, we are approving or we're dismissing the weight of the sin or dismissing how much it hurt. And that's why when you forgive someone, don't say, oh, that's okay. Say, I forgive you. Recognize and help them to recognize the weight of what it was that you're, you're forgiving. By saying that's okay, in a sense, you are giving permission for it to happen again. So say, I forgive you. Recognize the hurt it caused you, and also recognize that they are repenting of the weight of what they caused you. So I think that's very important. And we also need to forgive as God forgives. In Colossians 3, 12, and 13, um, it says, "Therefore, God, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, 
kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And uh, bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now, I highlighted uh, bear with each other and forgive one another. Um, I highlighted that because he says bear with, which implies a struggle, implies that there's weight to it, that there's, there's a value to it. Because if you bear with someone, it requires some effort. So Paul reminds us that when you, we forgive, there's something weighty there. There's, I, I keep using that example, but you know, it's a burden, it's a weight, it's something that you have to bear, just like Christ bared the cross. So it, it's important to remember that God understands that when we forgive, it takes some effort. It takes a struggle. Uh, some things are easier to forgive than others. But there's nothing that's unforgivable in our lives. With our person-to-person interactions, there is nothing at all that's unforgivable. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes time and prayer. It takes support. It takes being in church surrounded by people who can support you through it. But there's nothing unforgivable. Um, so, and Paul also reminds us in that passage, uh, in uh, verse uh, 12, where he says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, if you think about Galatians, what does that remind you of? There's nine elements in Galatians, but here there's just a few. This is Paul reiterating the fruit of the Spirit. Because he's talking about several of the aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. The kindness, uh, humility, gentleness, and patience. So we have to be empowered by the Spirit in order to do these things. Forgiving someone of a deep hurt or a deep sin takes the power of the Spirit. uh, The fruit of the Spirit. So Paul, very consistent in his writing, using these examples. And as Paul wrote in the love chapter which is actually about spiritual gifts and not just romantic love. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5, Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful, or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way, it is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. So here again in, um, in 1 Corinthians 13, we're being told to forgive completely. And if you keep a record of the wrongs, have you truly forgiven completely? If you say, yeah, you're forgiven, but this is the 90th time you've done this, I kind of think that maybe you haven't fully forgiven because part of forgiveness is here, not holding a record of being wronged. Now, it doesn't mean that we completely forget and we, do, we continue to put ourselves in a situation where somebody sins against us. But when we forgive as God forgives, we can't hold that against them anymore. Um, In Matthew 18, we we read the uh, parable of the unforgiving servant. The servant is given uh, the gift of freedom of debts by a very gracious king. There is no way in the natural world this servant could have repaid his debt, as we read in uh, Matthew 18. Uh, The servant then later denied his brethren of a much smaller debt, of a much smaller sin. And the king's gift, which is meant to be shared, was not shared, was not given, was not passed on. And therefore the king with, um, took back his gift and put this ungrateful servant in jail because he denied the power of the gift of the forgiveness. So when we don't forgive others, we're denying the gift that we've been given. We've denied the value of it. Because there's nothing that God has forgiven us, that we shouldn't forgive others. There, like I said, there's nothing that's unforgivable between me and, and anybody else on this planet. And there's nothing unforgivable between any two people. It may, it may not be easy. Many times it's not easy. But there's nothing that's unforgivable between two people because of how much we've been given with our forgiveness from God. Just before this parable, in fact, what triggered Jesus to respond with this parable was Peter Uh, in uh, verses 21 through uh, 22, uh, reading from the Amplified. At this point, Peter got up the nerve to ask, Master, how many times do I forgive a brother or sister who hurts me? Seven? Jesus replied, seven? Hardly. Try 70 times seven. 
Now, was Jesus literally telling us that we have to forgive somebody 490 times, and then at 491, they're no longer forgiven? Sometimes the Bible is literal. Sometimes the Bible is using more figurative language. Here, Jesus was just turning on, it, on its ear Peter's attempt to find a loophole in forgiveness. It's like, hey, if I forgive him seven times, am I done? And Jesus is like, no, try 70 times seven. And then when we combine that with what Paul just told us, if we keep no record of it, how in the world do we get to 490 anyway? <laughs> and let's also think about it. How many of us here who have accepted the forgiveness of Jesus Christ were forgiven of at least 490 sins? How many of us have committed at least 490 mistakes since we accepted Christ? I don't believe that we sin every day. I think there's some days where we actually are in tune with the Lord and we, we don't fall short. But if we've walked for more than a year, maybe two years, I'm pretty sure there's 490 there that, that God could say, yep. And, I, and God's salvation is permanent, his forgiveness is permanent, and it's all-encompassing. So we should forgive like God forgives. It doesn't stop at 490. It doesn't stop at 4,900. It doesn't stop at 4,900,000. It stops when we no longer sin and we're in glory. That's when the forgiveness stops because it's over. There's no more enemy triggering us to make those mistakes and commit those sins. And as with God's prompting through the Holy Spirit, others sometimes need to be made aware of their mistake or their sin. Sometimes they're just simply unaware. Maybe they said or did something or they forgot something that they didn't realize hurt you and caused a rift. Sometimes they are truly oblivious, not because they don't care, but because they just don't see it. They missed it. And, you know, how many times have we been walking with the Lord after, you know, we've been saved, we think, I'm all right, I read my Bible today, I went to church this week, I, I gave to the homeless guy in the corner, I'm doing all right. And then suddenly the Holy Spirit's like, hey, this thing, yeah, we need to address that. And you suddenly realize that there's a sin or there's something in my life that I need to address. You are completely oblivious to it, but the Holy Spirit triggered the memory and then it's something you have to pray and work through. And that's how it is sometimes with our interpersonal relationships. Now, to be clear, we are not the Holy Spirit. We are not anybody's Holy Spirit. Not ourselves, not our friends, not our neighbors. Certainly not somebody that we have a, a, only an online relationship on uh, social media. I have a slide about this. So I want everyone to take a moment and read out loud the slide that's on there. I am not anyone's Holy Spirit. I am not anyone's Holy Spirit. If you're a parent, you're not your kid's Holy Spirit. Amen. If you're a wife, you're not your husband's Holy Spirit. Amen. And I hope Bobby listens to the replay. <laughs> okay, the Holy Spirit just got me on that one. Okay. Uh, husbands, we are not our wives' Holy Spirit. But when we're in relationship, when we're in a discipleship relationship, or when we're in a relationship uh, that's not necessarily discipleship, but just partnership, we have the opportunity, we have the obligation to tell somebody, hey, this hurt me. This was a sin in our relationship. We need to address it. We need to fix it. We need to make them aware, but we need to make them aware in love. Not in condemnation, because there is no condemnation in Christ. We, need to, we don't need to throw a closed Bible at them. We don't need to throw the book at them. We don't need to hit them over the head with it. We just need to come and have a loving conversation or sometimes a loving confrontation, where the goal is to be restored, where the goal is to be healed, not to win, but to be healed. Because Jesus didn't come to reconcile us to God for, you know, to get one up on somebody. He came to bring us back to him so that we could spend eternity with him, to regain us as his brethren in heaven. He, it wasn't about it was a victory, but it wasn't about the victory. It was about the reconciliation and the healing of the relationship between God and his children. And we need to have that same focus and that same mindset. And like with you know, Paul's body analogy, if I, do some, if I touch the, a hot eye on the stove and I burn my finger, the finger has to communicate to the brain, hey, we've made a mistake, I'm hurt. So two things happen. First, the brain logs, oh, maybe I shouldn't touch that hot eye again. And the second thing the brain does is it sends the chemicals within the body to start the healing process. It sends the water to form the blister. It sends you know, the, the red and white blood cells to start fixing the damaged skin. 
So that's what we have to do. We have to be willing to say, hey, I'm hurt. We need to fix this and do it within the body. And Jesus was an amazing teacher because he gave us the model for how to do that reconciliation, to do that healing. Um, in Matthew 18, Matthew 18 is a very important uh, passage uh, that I drew from this time. So that one I would encourage you to read uh, this week if you have time. Uh, Matthew 18 and verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Now, did that say go blast it on social media and text everybody you know that, hey, so-and-so just did this? No. Go and have one-on-one conversation in love. Focus on the relationship because that's the most important part. The sin, the thing that they did that hurt you, is not the important part. It's the healing and the growth and the relationship that's the most important thing. That's what's going to matter 10,000 years from now. What the the mistake was that they made is not going to matter so much as whether or not the relationship was restored. And and your jobs and your function within the body of Christ could advance forward because the healing happened. So continuing, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Verse 16, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So there, if the one-on-one conversation didn't work, if there was still a denial of the rift, go and bring two or three people and have somebody be a mediator. So there's two things that Jesus is telling us here. Because earlier he told us, blessed are the peacemakers. Here he's saying that there need to be two or three peacemakers to come with you to mediate and to, to address the charges of what is going on between you. And continuing in verse 17, if he refuses, listen to them. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. So the first step, one-on-one conversation. The second step, bring two or three people who are peacemakers, who are willing to be, to stand in that gap between you and this other person to bring healing, to restore the relationship. And then if that doesn't work, bring it before the church. And then if the relationship cannot be healed, cannot be reconciled, if there's still this rift where there's something that's hurting people, then it's okay to separate yourself from that person. Uh, Paul reiterates this later, that it's okay to cut them off because eventually God will get through to them. Eventually they'll receive, hey, I messed up, I need to go fix this. And hopefully we pray that they'll come back. But it's not about hatred, it's not about you hurt me, you stink, get out. It's about I can't keep letting you hurt me. I can't keep letting the sin go unforgiven and unresolved. So I need you to step away. So you cut yourself away from being hurt constantly. So it's okay to get away from people that are hurting you, that are, that may trip you up in your walk because they cause so much pain that you can lose focus on what is real and what is eternal. So even if there is no reconciliation or healing, the love for that person should continue. The prayers for that person should continue. The blessings for that person should continue. Blessing them, hoping that someday they'll see the truth and see the love and the presence and the power of God. And because the entire Bible, the story of our, that is humanity's reconciliation story with God, it's a story of reconciliation because as Paul tells us, going back to 2 Corinthians 5, uh, this time I'm going to read from the NLT, And all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. And when we're in relationship with God, when we're close to God, when they come back to God, they're going to be by nature in relationship with us again. So our ministry of reconciliation is first the other people to God, but more important, and also as importantly, it's reconciling them to us because we are the body, we are the bride of Christ, and the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, cannot be broken with different function, uh, different people doing the things that are not honoring and that are not in relationship. Because the biggest thing to take from this message and from the message of the Bible is it's all about relationship. 
It's not about right versus wrong so much as it's about relationship. Because when we're in the relationship, when we're close to Christ, the right versus wrong takes care of itself. Because we're going to be in love with Christ. We're going to be in love with God. We're going to be in love with the Holy Spirit so much that we're going to be driven not to do anything that that causes offense. And we model that in our day-to-day relationships because we should love people so much that we don't want to do an offense to them either. So be a part of the body. Be willing to be reconciled. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Our job isn't, like I said, isn't just to reconcile with those we have a rift, but as we saw earlier, as part of the two or three witnesses, as part of the church, we should work as the peacemakers between two parties that have a rift to bring them together. Because if they listen, we've gained our brother. Now, as, I, you know, uh, as I've been going on social media and every once in a while picking a debate, talking with people, I keep seeing this image of Jesus. And in this image of Jesus, I see Jesus nailed to the cross, where it's left wing versus right wing, us versus them. And the nails in his hand are our pride, our unwillingness to admit that we're wrong, our unwillingness to hear the other side and value their opinion and their experience. And so many of us within the church have chosen either to be on the left nail or be on the right nail, shouting at the other side saying, hey, you're wrong, hey, you're ignorant, hey, you're this, that, and the other thing. But in that image, I I want to see myself in the middle where Jesus is struggling to bring both parties together, bring both sides together. Because, as I said, it's important to be right, but being right isn't the same as being righteous. If you say what's true, but you say it with no love, just like 1 Corinthians 13 tells you, it doesn't matter. If you say the truth with power but no love, it doesn't mean anything. So when you're fighting and you're on the right nail or the left nail and you're telling the other side that they're wrong and you're insulting them, you're you're saying spiteful things to try to prove that you're right, you're just as wrong as they are. And so it's important to try to be in the middle where Christ is, to bring both sides together, to reconcile, to see the value in their opinion, and then go back to the Word. Because the Word is, is unchanging. The Word is the barometer by which we need to live our lives. We need to measure everything against the Word because it's unchanging, it's perfect, and it's complete. The Bible tells us don't add or change anything because there will be consequences when you add or change things to the Word. There's a reason that we have 66 books. And God who created the entire universe, who simply spoke the universe into existence and then made human beings out of mud, I think the man can handle, or I call him a man, I think God can handle publishing a book. Now there have been, you know, there are books, you know, Bibles printed with typos, but the message of the Bible, the truth of the Bible is unchanging. It's real. And it's what we need to go back to. Saying, I feel does not mean that it's truth. I think does not mean that it's truth. Because if it contradicts the Bible, it's not truth. So we need to see Jesus on that cross, realize the nails that are holding him up, and then try not to be those those nails. Try not to be the reason he's up there. Try to be where he's at in the middle and bring more people together at the foot of the cross. We have to sacrifice our pride. We have to sacrifice our need to be right and focus on being righteous and being the light of Christ. I tell people all the time that you need to walk into a room and be the gate through which Jesus enters that room. And it's so important for us to be together because the world is so active in trying to tear us apart. They want us to argue. They want us to be... They want to say that if you support this politician, then then you're a heathen and you're a hypocrite. If you support this politician, you're a heathen, you're a hypocrite. And it's like, well, there's only two parties, so I I have nobody to support. So that's why we need to be in the middle where Christ is. Bring people to Christ to the foot of the cross. Be the example that Christ is. And, And that's the whole point. We have a ministry of reconciliation. Reconcile people to God, reconcile people to ourselves so that we can surround ourselves and surround others to have that pack mentality of we are going to protect the body of Christ 
from the attacks of the roaring, roaming lion looking for somebody to devour. So this is the point. Let's be the light that attracts people from both sides to the foot of the cross. Let us work to reconcile the body of Christ so that it is stronger, so that it can withstand the slings and arrows of the world. Because if you look at a lot of the things happening in the world, they're coming after the body of Christ because they don't want us to, ha- to stand strong because they're convicted, even though they won't admit it, they're convicted about what Jesus stands for. Because he doesn't stand for what they feel or what they think. He stands for truth. He stands for the, for the God that created the universe. So we need to stand together and we need to bring more people to us. So, as we wrap up, I want to encourage you, if you have somebody that you need to reconcile with, whether it's somebody that's hurt you, or sometimes even more more difficult is realizing that you have hurt them. If you need it, come, uh, come forward and we'll pray with you. Pray for the strength to forgive. Pray for the wisdom to know who you need to reconcile with. Because it's so important. One of the hardest things and then one of the most freeing things that ever happened was when I moved to Chicago, I messaged my ex-wife and I apologized for everything that I did. I, it, it wasn't a reconciliation where we entered into a relationship because we don't talk because there's really not a need. She's remarried, I'm remarried now. So there's no need for, for us to c- continue a relationship but we've, said our, our, we've repented together and we've moved on. It, it, it freed me. And then I, I reconciled with other people that I know I've hurt. Not to create a new relationship, but to free myself from the burden of knowing that I've caused pain. But also, hopefully, to maybe free them from feeling disposable, from feeling unworthy. So if you have somebody in your life that you need to recon- have reconciliation with, have forgiveness with, whether it's something you've done or something they've done, come forward and let's pray about it. Or if you want to pray in your seat, pray about it. It's so important. Not to be doomed, but sometimes you don't get the chance when you wait. Sometimes you don't get the chance to say you're sorry. And as I said, there's nothing on this earth that's been done to you, as hard as it may be to swallow, that's unforgivable. Abuse, neglect, betrayal, as hard as it is to swallow, it's not unforgivable because God himself has forgiven them if they choose to receive that forgiveness. And sometimes the people that have hurt you the worst, you're the person that God needs to lead them back to him. So your grace and your forgiveness and your love in light of Christ can be their pathway to salvation. And it's about letting go of your pride and your hurt and trusting that God has a plan for them. So if you want to come forward for prayer, you're welcome to. If you want to stay there and pray, do that. Do business with God and see who you need to be reconciled with. Because it's important. It's what Jesus has commanded. It's what God has brought us to do. So it's so important. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to come together each Sunday and just learn more about you, think more about you, and learn more about what our calling is. Father, I pray for everybody here, and myself included, that if there are rifts and there are places that need reconciliation, I pray that you'll open those doors, open those doors of communication, and give us the strength and the wisdom to say what is needed to be said. Protect our hearts and our spirits from further injury, But let us be reconciled. And if it's somebody that doesn't know you that we need to be reconciled to, give us the wisdom and just the light and the power of Christ so that we can draw them to you as we work to reconcile with them. Because at the end of the day, at the end of time, that's the most important thing. Are they reconciled to you through Jesus Christ? And through our pain and suffering, sometimes that is how you redeem those lost souls. So help us to accept that and and wear it as a badge of honor to be able to serve in your kingdom in those painful times. Because you promise that you work all things for the good of those who love you, who are called according to your purpose. And you give us these promises in your word. And we claim them and we stand on them and we pray that we can be reconciled to others. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.